Welcome to the final lecture in Riparian Function and Management, a new online class created by Sky and Mary Kate at Nueces River Authority, piloted by Sol Ross State University through a sustainable ranch management program under the direction of Dr. Bonnie Warnock. Thank you for participating in this course. The purpose of this course was to introduce the components of physical function in a river system's riparian area and to build understanding about how riparian condition can be influenced by management decisions. This is information that has not been widely available in Texas, hence our riparian areas are among the least understood or most misunderstood pieces of the Texas landscape. Over the last six weeks, we have evaluated hydrology, vegetation and soils, the three components of physical function, and we will discuss the natural processes that occur within the riparian zone. Students have learned to recognize the functional condition that allows riparian areas to withstand and benefit from floods and droughts. You have also heard that functional conditions produce desirable values, such as clean water, sustained flows, fish and wildlife habitat, livestock forage, recreation, and aesthetic beauty. We explored cause and effect relationships, degradation and recovery processes, and we learned to identify activities that may be hindering riparian recovery. A riparian area is the part of the landscape that flanks rivers and streams, shown in blue on this picture. It does not include the channel or the water. It is the land that lies between the drier uplands and the wetted channel. Sometimes the riparian areas stand out as the greener, more lush area, much in contrast to the less green uplands. Poetically, it can be thought of as a ribbon of land that follows and interacts with the waterway. Much of the course focused on physical function. A properly functioning riparian area along with moving water, is defined as one that has enough stuff, enough vegetation, landform, or large woody material to, first and foremost, dissipate stream energy. It can stabilize banks, reduce erosion, trap sediment, build or enlarge floodplains, store water, act in flood water retention, groundwater recharge, as well as sustained base flow. And if these processes are all occurring, then they will produce water quality, water quantity, forage, aquatic habitat, wildlife habitat, recreational value, as well as aesthetic beauty. If you'll remember, it is physical function that produces the values that we all appreciate and demand from creeks. This is the key concept of this course and a valuable concept that can be applied to creeks and rivers anywhere on the planet. Most mistakes and problems with riparian management and understanding stem from a wholehearted belief in a myth. This course has offered students an opportunity to dissect myths into truth and fiction. So here are some common myths. One is that floods are bad. Well, only when there's not enough vegetation, landform, or large woody material to dissipate flood energy. What about that droughts are bad? Well, droughts are not fun, but during droughts, the roots of riparian vegetation actually chase the declining water tables, helping to form root-fortified beds and channels. Also, some say streams should be wide and straight, when actually they mostly want to be narrow and crooked. Also, large wood clogs creeks and should be removed is a common myth. Unless there is an overriding health and safety issue, wooden debris should always be left in place where it falls or where it drifts so it can become able to dissipate the flood energy and to help trap other debris, to be a nursery for new plants and to later become buried and incorporated into the stream beds and banks. Some say removal of riparian vegetation increases stream flow. Well, this uh, can damage during, cause damage during flooding and it usually does not contribute toward a sustainable increase in base flow. In fact, the opposite is usually true. Riparian vegetation helps to slow water and trap sediments 
and to enhance water storage, leading to a more sustained release of stored water to support base flow during the dry times. Some say cut banks are bad. When only when they are not balanced with deposition on point bars with a meandering stream. And the biggest myth of all is that people have to fix them. Truly, creeks and rivers will usually heal themselves if we can identify and remove whatever it is that's hindering their recovery. Riparian areas are often represented by tiny blue lines on this map. Together, they are a small piece of the overall landscape. Most of the land in Texas is upland, and most of the land and natural resource management efforts in Texas have been focused on the upland landscape. The tiny riparian landscape has been mostly ignored, and it has been the stepchild of resource management programs and the sacrifice area of many agricultural operations. Now in Texas, we are realizing, as most other western states already have, that riparian areas, despite their small size, are responsible for providing a disproportionate set of important water benefits that they have been mostly misunderstood. You are among the first natural resource students within a Texas university to receive specific training in riparian function and management. At a glance, the functional and dysfunctional condition of riparian areas almost anywhere can be compared and contrasted by examining this very important characteristic, the presence of water storage in which we call a riparian sponge. In Texas and elsewhere in the United States, we are keen to call the area of the landscape that drains together to a point a watershed. This is the term that is widely used by agencies and institutions. In other parts of the world, especially in dry climates, they call this a catchment. So semantics do count. A shed seems to speak to water leaving the landscape, while a catchment evokes an image of water being caught or captured by the landscape. We hope that you go forth from this course promoting a new, better informed riparian paradigm by using the term catchment instead of shed. Let this image stick in your mind as a contrast between water catching and water shedding conditions on the landscape. Similarly, you can see this image as one with the contrast between a water shedding creek and a water catching creek. Riparian areas are dynamic. They are where soil, water, and vegetation all interact as a finely tuned machine, the gears of which are inextricably connected and interdependent. Let's review the parts of a stream and some of the processes that are occurring there. If you'll recall, the channel is confined by the banks. The floodplain, which is composed of sediments, the normal base flow, which is where the fish live, the flood flows, and remember flooding is an important and essential component of the creek river system, the water table, also a part of the creek, the vegetation, the large woody material, which could include fallen or dead trees, and all of the other organic litter and debris. Then the processes and dynamics that occur and involve these parts, mostly during flooding, will include erosion and deposition of the sediments, bankful discharge, which is the level of flow that does most of the work of channel formation, sinuosity, which is the crookedness and an important energy dissipation scheme, the width to depth ratio, a measurement that can quantify channel conditions, gradient, the slope of the channel, a measurement of steepness, which is calculated by the change in elevation over the length of the channel, and recruitment, the process of inviting new plants to establish and survive, survival being the key to recruitment. Root density, which we can see the vegetation above the ground, but imagine what you can't see, which is the mass of roots and buried debris that holds the bank in place. And channel stability, the vertical and horizontal stability, which both are important. 
Too much energy and not enough energy dissipation will lead to instability. And last, plant succession, which is the process of change in the species structure of the plant community over time. In the riparian area, the group of plants that colonize fresh sediment may not be the same plants that end up stabilizing that same area. Fluvial geomorphology is the study of form and function of streams and the interaction between the streams and the landscape around them. It includes consideration of channel dimension, of the channel pattern, and of the profile, augmented by a consideration of channel roughness. Ecologists classify water bodies as either lentic or lotic. Lentic, also known as lacustrine ecosystems, is a system characterized by still water, such as lakes and ponds and swamps. Lotic, also referred to as riverine ecosystems, is a system characterized by actively moving water. This course is focusing on lotic, the actively moving water, moving water systems, but riparian areas are also valuable to lentic systems. A free-flowing stream will usually include a variety of features. Riffles are shallow, fast-moving areas where breaking water is visible on the surface. Runs are swift and they can be shallow, but the surface is smooth and not breaking. And there are pools which are deeper and much slower than runs. The sequence of riffles, runs, and pools is an important factor in the aquatic habitat, but are also key energy dissipating features. Most large streams have at least three general reaches. First, there is a sediment production reach. This area is often the headwaters of a river. Second, there is a sediment transport reach. This is usually the middle reach. And third, there is a sediment deposition reach. One on a large river is near its mouth and crossing flat country. So knowing the classification can aid in understanding the stream's plant communities as well as its overall functional condition. An important factor in understanding a particular stream or reach in its riparian condition hinges on the presence of water. Therefore, knowing what kind of flow it usually receives is helpful. Ephemeral streams flow only in direct response to storm runoff and they are not connected to a groundwater table. Seasonal or intermittent streams flow occasionally and they may flow for extended periods of time, enjoying a temporary association with groundwater. The riparian function we will be exploring in this course applies to perennial streams, those that flow most of the time except during severe drought, and they are connected to a groundwater table. Perennial streams can contain interrupted reaches. In southwest Texas, it is commonplace for perennial streams to lose all of their flow to aquifer recharge as they cross over certain geological features called recharge zones. Perennial streams can display seasonal or ephemeral conditions through a given reach. Perennial streams can also be interrupted temporarily or permanently by overpumping, channel incision, climate change, and dams or surface impoundments. Here you can see visual examples of natural potential for riparian sites and the capability for riparian sites given major human influences. When expecting recovery, it is important to understand the potential and any factors influencing its capability. In evaluating the condition of riparian areas, it is important to recognize limitations to function that may be outside of our control or ability to manage. The term riparian potential is used to qualify possible limitations to improved function. 
Potential is defined as the highest ecological status that a riparian wetland area can attain given zero political, social, or economical constraints. Potential is often limited. For example, political, social, or economical realities are thought to constrain a return of the previous water table levels across the western Carrizo Aquifer. These realities are compounded by the fact that the Carrizo Aquifer is very slow to recharge. The perennial potential of many streams may have been altered permanently. Capability can be defined as the highest ecological status an area can attain given political, social, or economical constraints, which are often referred to as limiting factors. Lane's balance helps us understand the relationships between water and sediment at bank full. The two sides of the equation, in their simplest form, represent energy and energy dissipation. The sediment side of the balance is the energy dissipator, and the water side is the energy generator. Lane's balance does not consider the role of vegetation. In Lane's equation, all energy dissipation was a function of sediment size and channel slope. But in reality, vegetation plays an enormous role in both recovery and stability. Vegetation helps to buffer dramatic swings in the water sediment balance. Erosion and deposition will still occur in well-vegetated riparian areas, but their magnitude and extent are mitigated by the energy dissipation provided by strong Root, strong rooted dense vegetation. This role can be visualized by a woven band of stems, vines, and roots binding the balance beam. Vegetation also plays a large role in riparian water storage. As fine sediments containing organic matter are trapped and held, the water holding capacity is enhanced. Riparian plants are generally divided into five categories. They include sedges and rushes, grasses, woody plants, forbs, and ferns and vines. No single type is better or preferable to one another. For example, some riparian areas are highly functional without woody plants, and others are almost entirely woody plants and large trees. A stability rating, or SR, is assigned to riparian plants according to the plant's observed ability to withstand the erosive forces of water in most of Texas. The rating scale is 1 to 10. So an SR1 would be equal to bare ground, and an SR10 would be equal to the strength of anchored rock. And at the middle, an SR6 or 7 would have the minimum strength for bank stabilization. The vegetation growing within a riparian area can indicate the presence or absence of groundwater connections, the key indicator of perennial flow. A wetland indicator, or WI, status is assigned to plants according to the degree of soil moisture needed and tolerated by the plant. This rating is based on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's wetland plant list compiled in 1988 with numerous revisions. WI status varies somewhat between regions within the United States. The Remarkable Riparian Field Guide uses the 2014 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Regional Wetland Plant List for the Great Plains region, which includes most of Texas. There are five wetland indicator categories. There is the obligate wetland plants, almost always found in wetland locations. There is the facultative wetland plants, usually found in wet locations. Then there are facultative plants, found equally in wet and dry non-wet locations. Facultative upland plants are usually found in dry, non-wet locations. And upland plants are almost always found in dry, non-wet locations. An abundance of obligate or facultative wet plants indicates that the riparian area is storing water and maintaining a water table connection for much of the year. This condition is sometimes referred to as the riparian sponge. Likewise, a ripi riparian area lacking obligate and fac wet plants 
indicates that the riparian area is not storing water effectively, which can be a sign of groundwater table decline. Riparian plants are also categorized into three functional groups. There are pioneers, which are plants that live where others cannot. Then there are colonizers, which are quick-spreading, sediment-trapping plants that put down a mat of new, delicate roots by stolons or rhizomes. And third, there are stabilizers. These would be your woody and herbaceous plants, which usually are tall and upright with strong, dense root masses. Though they are slower to establish, once they do establish, stabilizers are strong and more permanent. As mentioned, pioneers live where other plants cannot. On some headwater rivers, especially in central Texas, large destabilized gravel deposits are common. These are harsh environments for plants. They lack shade and soil and they can have poor water holding capacity. Plants that grow up on these large barren gravel deposits are very special. They are pioneers, mostly facultative and upland plants, and they aid in preparing for more favorable conditions for future riparian plants to grow. People usually don't love pioneer plants, but pioneer plants play an essential role in riparian recovery. Some examples of pioneer riparian plants include Bacchus, Sycamore, Lindheimer indigo, desert willow, little walnut, burrow bush, and brickle bush. Another group of early recovery plants that are not quite as brave as pioneers we call colonizers. Colonizers are usually among the first plants to establish in freshly deposited sediment. These plants spread quickly, creating a mat of new roots by stolons or rhizomes. Also, they're the first fast growers which trap sediment and create niches for deeper rooted plants to take hold. Colonizers usually grow right at the water's edge and even out into the water. They are very critical to recovery. Early stage colonizers are very weak rooted. Their main function is to spread quickly and they are critical to the recovery of riparian areas. Some early stage colonizer plants include frog fruit, water primrose, water cress, and pennywort. None of these have the stability to stand up to a high energy event, but they are all very good at catching and holding fine sediments, thus playing a very important role by preparing the way for stronger rooted stabilizing plants. Late stage colonizers have stronger roots but do not grow as quickly. As the early stage colonizers, they do not grow as quickly as the early stage colonizers. They provide a combination of colonizer and stabilizer functions though. Some late stage colonizer plants with moderate stability ratings include spike rush, black sedge, knotgrass, and bushy bluestem, all with SR6s. These all have a slightly higher stability rating than the early stages and pioneers, but still they need the help of strong stabilizers so to resist and dissipate flood energy. Stabilizer plants are tall, upright plants with strong, dense root mass. They are both woody and herbaceous. They are slow to establish, yet they are strong and permanent and have large, stout top growth. Woody stabilizer plants function as riparian rebar because of their large root diameter and their ability to interlace with fibrous herbaceous roots. Some examples of stabilizer plants include switchgrass with an SR9, buttonbush with an SR8, emery sedge, SR9, and also gulf cordgrass with an SR9. In order for riparian vegetation to work, it needs to be present and healthy. Key vegetative considerations include, is the area covered with plants? Are they expanding? Is there a community of strong stabilizers to provide a stabilizing root mass? And are they present and are they capable? If the system requires large wood, and not all do, is there a source that can become incorporated into the beds and banks? Are the plants healthy and vigorous, or are they overgrazed and overbrowsed or over mowed? 
Is there a diverse plant community in terms of species? Are plants of different ages present? Some old and middle-aged, but also some young and new plants. And do the plants tell you that there is water present? Are they indicative of wet conditions? And are there obligate or fac wet species? The riparian bullseye evaluation tool found in the back of your remarkable riparian field guide can help you to develop your eyes to see riparian areas for their function as well as guide you to identify activities that may be hindering the natural riparian recovery process. This evaluation tool considers active floodplain, energy dissipation, new plant colonization, presence of stabilizing vegetation, age diversity among riparian plants, species diversity among riparian plants, plant vigor, water storage indications, bank and channel erosion balance, and sediment deposition amount and location. Consistent notation of your observations with this guide, combined with photo point images collected over time, are key to evaluating riparian health. Not all of the bullseye parameters will be appropriate for all channel types. Leaving some portions of the target blank will not detract from your evaluation. Most of the 10 parameters will not apply to ephemeral streams. Likewise, some of the indicators will be difficult to evaluate on tidal influenced segments of coastal streams. Degraded dysfunctional creeks will recover on their own naturally. Let's review how dysfunction happens and how the natural processes can work together to heal a degraded and dysfunctional riparian area. Here is Blanco Creek a small creek on the Edwards Plateau in the hill country. The pasture that the creek runs through has been grazed for 100 plus years on a mostly continuous basis. Riparian areas are favored by livestock and without careful management will experience disproportionate pressure within a pasture. This creek has been scoured by successive floods. It has lost most of its riparian soils and the channel has cut down to bedrock and then wider and wider to accommodate flood waters. It is now overly wide and excessively shallow and an unhealthy width to depth ratio exists. The channel and banks are lacking in energy dissipation vegetation to slow flood waters and to trap sediment. Unfortunately, so many streams look like this one that this has become a norm. It's almost the way that we expect hill country creeks to look. Let's see how the Hill Country Creek channel might work in its functional condition. Many Hill Country Creek beds have built themselves on top of a layer of limestone rock. Blanco Creek is a perennial stream and it has a base flow. Then after some of the rains, the channel fills up and reaches a bank full level. Once the bank is overtopped, flood water will spill out onto the floodplain. Flood flows can then contribute water to the water table, which, if supported by a healthy, functional riparian area, will create a sponge-like condition. This riparian sponge water table then supports the base flow to the creek during the drier times. The channel here is stable and held in place by dense roots and buried logs. Unlike the one on Blanco Creek, it has a healthy width to depth ratio and the channel wouldn't be crooked. It would be appropriate if it were sinuous as the gradient flow and bed load supports. When the vegetation along the creek has been removed continuously and its recovery is hindered by constant grazing, the root density dwindles. No new plants are allowed to grow and plant succession is inhibited as it was on the Blanco Creek. There is not enough energy dissipation to slow the water down on a floodplain, and the banks begin to wash away and to erode, leading to a wider and wider channel. One way a creek ac accommodates an undissipated flood energy is by mining more and more material away from the banks until very little of the sponge or water table is left to feed the base flow. So now you can visualize what is missing from the riparian area in this photo on Blanco Creek. Again, 
what it looks like and what it could look like with recovery, but instead what is missing. In its current dysfunctional condition, Blanco Creek is missing its water storage capacity. The sponge has been eroded away. The channel has become overly wide. The amount of water that once represented bank full no longer fills the channel. The volume that once spilled over the bank and spread over the floodplain does not. It now takes a very large flood that would get out of the channel and when it comes, there is not sufficient energy dissipating vegetation, landform, or large woody material to slow it down. This overly wide channel cannot efficiently carry sediments and they begin to pile up in odd places. Its width to depth ratio is out of whack as it lacks sinuosity and channel stability. Removing the hindrance to recovery, in this case the grazing animals by fencing off the riparian area or temporarily resting the whole pasture, is the first step toward initiating riparian recovery. Once the hindrance is removed and the first vegetation is allowed to grow, then natural recovery can be remarkably quick. Recovery benefits from the dynamic process of flooding. Provided that the initial vegetation is allowed to grow, which may only be weeds or early stage colonizers, then when the floodwaters come, the colonizers slow water down and allow sediments to drop out. Debris from upstream limbs, root wads, and fallen trees, leaves, and even tiny bits of organic matter all can be captured. New plants are recruited to join other colonizing fresh sediments. These may not be favorable plants, but their survival is vital to plant succession. Before long, once conditions have improved, the bigger, stronger, stabilizing riparian plants begin to emerge. As the plants mature, so do their dense root systems, working to support channel formation. As the stream incorporates more and more debris and trap sediment, the channel width decreases and its depth and gradient will adjust. Pretty soon, the narrowing channel has begun to meander, developing sinuosity. This new sinuosity also aids in dissipating stream energy. A once dysfunctional riparian area like Blanco Creek recovered naturally when the hindrance to the process was addressed. Plants were allowed to grow by removing the grazing pressure, and in a relatively short period of time, like five to seven years, a remarkable recovery has taken place. The riparian area now has adequate vegetation, landform, and large woody material to stabilize banks, reduce erosion, trap sediment, build floodplain, store water, retain flood water, recharge groundwater, and sustain base flow, all the components of physical function. The channel is clearly defined and held above the bedrock by plant roots. Now at bank full, over a well vegetated floodplain and recharges the water table, which acts like a sponge in feeding the base flow, especially during dry times. A hindrance is an activity or situation that interferes with natural riparian recovery and healthy function, usually the result of human or animal activity. Hindrances can often be identified through close observation of the riparian vegetation. The following are common hindrances observed in the Texas riparian areas. Farming, mowing, or spraying weeds or brush too close to the bank logging and related timber harvest activities adjacent to the creek, manicured or altered residential or park landscapes next to a creek, 
prolonged grazing concentrations in creek areas, excessive population of deer, exotics, or feral hogs in creek areas, burning in riparian areas, removal of large dead wood and downed trees, artificial manipulation of banks, channels, or sediments, such as with bulldozing, physical alteration of floodplains, excessive vehicle traffic in the creek area, excessive recreational activity or foot traffic in a creek area, excessive alluvial pumping or other withdrawals, and in some cases, the excessive growth of invasive species, which could inhibit the ability of native riparian plants to do their job. Also, low water dams and large reservoirs, as well as poorly designed road crossings and bridges. Successful management of riparian is based on some important premises. First, we need to remember that they are small, but special places, special pieces within the landscape that need special consideration in management plans. They are sensitive to changes but are quite resilient. They are best thought of as key components of water catchments, not sheds. Their management has involved with understanding to include the idea of cooperation along a shared resource. And as with other landscapes, a strong stewardship ethic, stewardship ethic is a prerequisite to successful management. Riparian management practices and techniques are determined in large part by the surrounding land use. Land that is in agricultural production usually has different riparian issues than urban or recreational land. Likewise, land that is used for timber production has different issues than land used for row crops or for livestock grazing. We will review a few riparian management considerations for some of the most common land uses. Management of riparian areas in forest land primarily involve timber harvest practices. The size of the equipment used in timber harvest and the intensity of disturbance involved in transporting logs can lead to extreme disruption of the soil surface and associated vegetation. Furthermore, the subsequent preparation of seed beds to plant the next crop of trees adds even more disturbance. For these reasons, it has become standard practice for timber harvesting activities to include streamside management zones, or SMZs. These SMZs are similar in purpose to riparian buffers. The intent is to maintain undisturbed or lightly disturbed areas of native trees and shrubs adjacent to creeks and rivers. Streamside management zones are often planned at least 50 feet away from the top of the bank but width should vary according to the size of the creek and the length of the side slopes. When private landowners sell timber, it is recommended to have a written contract with stipulations so to protect riparian areas and to utilize the services of forestry professionals. Similarly, contract stipulations are also common in oil and gas lease agreements. Typical streamside management zone guidelines often include to minimize stream crossings, building no roads in the SMZ other than necessary crossings, to use temporary bridgements to skid logs where possible, avoiding traffic in wet weather to minimize rutting, keeping skidders away from banks and not using to not skid logs across the creek, creek channel, to use cable and chokers to skid logs, as well as to limit harvest to individual high-value trees. In addition to timber harvest considerations, cattle grazing can also affect riparian areas in forest land. Land that is intensively used for recreational purposes is also vulnerable to riparian degradation. Creek and river areas subject to heavy recreational use can be some of the most abused and degraded riparian areas in the state. Continual long-term human foot traffic often reduces dense riparian vegetation and creates compacted bare ground. The following management practices can be used in recreational areas so to reduce negative impacts. Eliminate or restrict vehicle traffic in riparian areas. Trails should not be aggressively devegetated. Trails should not be immediately adjacent or parallel to creeks. 
Meander trails back and forth across the flood floodplain. Place main trails on higher ground with periodic access trails down to the stream. Locate periodic access trails on inside bends with less stream energy. Separate heavy use areas with buffers of thick natural vegetation. Choose less vulnerable areas for heavy use such as inside bends. Rotate heavy use areas to allow for periods of recovery. Limit mowing and increase the interval between mowing to encourage vegetation. Rotate mowed areas to help manage human activity. Rotate heavy use access points to allow adequate time for vegetation to recover. Do not remove large logs and dead fallen trees and creeks along banks or in the floodplain. And provide educational material to describe the reasons why these practices are carried out. Most creeks in urban areas have been altered in one way or another. Removal, of alt removal or alteration of natural riparian vegetation is quite common. The increased runoff in urban areas combined with riparian alteration creates a great risk of erosion during high flow events. Retaining or restoring a buffer of natural vegetation will help maintain a degree of riparian function. Land within urban settings or developing areas creates one of the greatest challenges to riparian management for several reasons. The land area that drains into urban creeks is often highly altered by a large proportion of impervious surface, a high runoff water shedding landscape. These impervious surfaces create rapid and high volume runoff even with small rainfall events. A great volume of runoff entering tributaries and creeks can wreak havoc on channels, causing abnormal and severe erosion, bank failure, down cutting, and other problems. In addition to the flashy nature of urban creeks, urban development often encroaches into the floodplain, restricting the ability of the creek to naturally meander. Encroachment of development into the floodplain results in the alterations of floodplain topography and vegetation. The net result of these alterations is a reduced capacity for the floodplain to function as it should. In addition to the flashy nature of urban creeks, urban development often encroaches into the floodplain, restricting the ability of the creek to naturally meander. Encroachment of development into the floodplain results in the alteration of floodplain topography and vegetation. Again, the net result of these alterations is a reduced capacity for the floodplain to function as it should. Municipalities or subdivisions that desire to minimize damage to creeks and to help maintain semi-functional riparian conditions can plan developments to retard runoff and to retain wide, well-vegetated riparian areas. The reduction of impervious surfaces, rainwater harvesting, Detention storage of storm water, water gardens, green belts, and other practices are used in some developments to help maintain some natural riparian function. There are forested riparian lands that are used for grazing, but most grazing land is either in range, pasture, or farmland. We will review some of the most important considerations for grazing in range and pastureland riparian areas. Many good technical references are available, including TR 1737-20, Grazing Management Processes and Strategies for Riparian Wetland Areas. Grazing can affect the following functional attributes of riparian areas. Energy dissipation, root mass and root stability, bank and channel stability, sediment trapping, colonization of new sediments, plant diversity, plant recruitment and plant vigor, proper riparian grazing management, which will favor these elements, and improper management, which will inhibit them. Cattle will naturally congregate in riparian areas in search of forage water and as a way to stay cool. Managers have found ways to overcome this disproportionate grazing. Short-term seasonal grazing followed by a long-term recovery period is one way to ensure that riparian vegetation stays in good condition. Because of the natural attraction of cattle to creeks, these areas require extra care and extra attention to ensure that they are grazed properly and that they receive periods of rest after being grazed. 
One of the most common and successful forms of riparian grazing management is to establish separate riparian pastures. Often this requires substantial fencing to separate the creek areas from the rest of the pasture. Ranchers who choose this option are usually careful to create creek pastures that are large enough to be manageable, not simply a long skinny pasture. Often the rancher will set the fence 100 or 200 yards from the edge of the creek. And when this is done, the riparian area becomes much easier to manage. The rancher determines when, how many, and for how long the creek pasture should be grazed and uses the pasture as part of a flexible grazing rotation. It is better to graze riparian pastures with a large number of animals for a shorter period of time rather than with a small number for a longer period of time. This approach is sometimes called flash grazing, but this does not mean that riparian areas are grazed short. By managing the number of days of grazing, the manager can ensure the desired level of grazing is achieved. Good residual cover should remain even at the end of the grazing period. By controlling the length of the rest period, the rancher can be assured that adequate time is given for regrowth. One or two short grazing periods per year with a long rest between will generally allow for good development of riparian vegetation and a strong deep root system. Financial incentives are available to landowners who wish to construct riparian pastures to help defray the cost of fencing. One of the most potentially damaging times to graze a creek area is when the banks are saturated. Saturated banks are weaker and more prone to sloughing and trampling damage by livestock. The least damaging time to graze a creek area is during the dormant season, as long as good stubble remains intact. Grazing in early or mid-spring must be carefully managed since key riparian grasses, sedges, and woody plants are making a flush of new tender growth and are much more vulnerable than normal. For those managers unable to establish separate riparian pastures, there are other ways to help overcome disproportionate grazing in the creek area. Providing alternate water locations away from the creek often helps to lure livestock out of the creek. Studies have shown that cattle generally prefer to drink from troughs on level ground compared to walking down steep banks. Cattle will often choose to drink out of troughs even when they have access to creek water. This may or may not be enough of an enticement to eliminate concentrated grazing on a creek area, but usually it does help. Another way to reduce time that livestock spends near the creek is to move all mineral, salt, hay, tubs, and other supplemental feedings at least a half mile away from the creeks or to the far side of the pasture. When feeding areas and water locations are moved away from the creek, animals will spend less time grazing and loafing in that riparian area and the vegetation in the banks will stay in much better condition. For creeks that have been severely damaged by decades of unmanaged grazing, a good solution may be to temporarily suspend grazing for several years so to jumpstart the recovery of desirable vegetation. This method of riparian management is being used on many Texas ranches with excellent results. Landowners and managers seem gratified with the speed and decree of recovery and improvement. The goal is not permanent removal of livestock. As the vegetation recovers and as the condition of the riparian area improves, livestock grazing is often resumed using the principles described above or previously. In some cases, ranchers have preferred to permanently remove the livestock from riparian areas. This is especially true when the creek or rivers form the boundaries of the property and there is just no practical way to keep livestock from wandering away or to keep neighboring cattle out. Riparian management can be complicated by many situations. Some common riparian management issues that may challenge managers include fragmentation in riparian areas, grazing management in riparian areas, management of native and exotic wildlife, retaining large wood, management of exotic riparian plants, riparian management downstream from reservoirs, and engineered solutions. 
Each of these issues introduces its own set of complexities. Riparian management issues were discussed at length in RM4, and students who are researching and presenting on management issues should review RM4 in preparation for their assignment. In this course, we introduce students to various assessment and monitoring tools. Remember that assessment and monitoring are different. Assessment, or evaluation, generally refers to a snapshot of a riparian condition at a point in time. Upward and downward trends may also be identifiable through an assessment. Monitoring, however, infers periodic tracking, so to determine changes of the time. Photos from a thoughtfully established photo point can be most helpful in this regard. The bullseye is an informal valuation based on observations of 10 particular factors. It is a simplified means of guiding observation to determine functional conditions of riparian areas. As with other evaluations, it is best to look at as much of a creek or river as possible rather than examining only a single isolated spot. The bullseye evaluation considers eight vegetation items and two hydrology geomorphology items. Proper functioning condition, or PFC, is likewise an evaluation, but also includes trend identification and relies on a multidisciplinary team approach. The team could include hydrologists, geomorphologists, soil scientists, ecologists, range specialists, fishery biologists, as well as wetland scientists. PFC considers 17 items. Five are related to hydrology, seven have to do with vegetation, and five deal with geomorphology. We also have discussed Stream Visual Assessment Protocol, or SVAP. SVAP is more complicated assessment that mixes in a look of value production along with physical function. SVAP considers physical items such as channel condition, hydrologic alteration, bank condition, canopy cover, and riparian ahead of myself there, bank condition, riparian area width, and canopy cover. Also, it considers water appearance, nutrient enrichment, manure presence, pools, barriers to fish, habitat complexity, invertebrate commu community, riffle embeddedness, as well as salinity. Formal monitoring relies on a fixed protocol for repeatability, precision, accuracy, and statistical relevance. Sometimes monitoring and evaluation are confused and therefore results in confusing conclusions. Also, we learned about multiple indicator monitoring, a former monitoring protocol for riparian areas. MIM metrics include stubble height, percent of brow use, percent of stable bank, percent of sapling or young vegetation, green line stability rating, mean green line width, ecological status, wetland rating, percent hydric vegetation, substrate size classes, and pull frequency or depth. Successful completion of this course will be marked by the student's ability to evaluate riparian conditions, to identify potential for improved functional condition, to identify hindrances to riparian recovery, to envision recovered conditions, and to identify limitations to recovery capability.